Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs> Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We visit the largest reptile zoo in Minnesota. We revisit wedding traditions from once upon a time. We talk to a mystery writer from Mankato. And we learn about the old time art of quilt making. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. The Reptile, Amphibian, and Discovery Zoo, or RAD Zoo for short, is located in Owatonna. It is home to over 150 types of animals from all over the world. The zoo is the biggest of its kind in Minnesota and one of the largest in the nation. We talked with Jamie Pastica, the owner and operator of RAD Zoo, about what it's like to have a job like his. We do have a, a real passion for doing this. I mean, the number of hours we have to put in, I mean, we're out here building new exhibits and um, it late into the night sometimes. And it, it does, it, it's, it is a whole lot of work, but I mean, we love what we do, so um, it makes it all worthwhile. My name's Jamie Pastick and I'm the director of the Reptile and Amphibian Discovery Zoo, or RAD Zoo for short, located here in Owatonna, Minnesota. The Rad Zoo is one of Minnesota's um, premier um, animal attractions. We're the largest exhibit of reptiles and amphibians in the state and one of the largest in the world. And we feature over 150 different kinds of reptiles and amphibians as well as a few birds and fish and invertebrates. Our goal is to try to um, encourage the kids to have that love of wildlife, to have an appreciation for these animals. Sometimes our reptiles and amphibians are less accepted. Um, a lot of people have that innate fear of snakes and crocodiles, we've even met people that are afraid of frogs on some of our travels, but um, we just try to encourage kids to, that these animals are an important part of nature and that they're, that they're actually very cool. Um, we have our animals here at the zoo that the kids come and check out and then we do traveling shows where we um, share animals with um, kids all over the state at schools, libraries and birthday parties and we just want to um, just give kids an appreciation for these unique animals. So our zoo is uh, kind of a family business. My wife and I were both zookeepers in the past before we started up our own. Um, we have three young daughters that help us out with the animals, as well as a few um, paid staff zookeepers. We have college interns that come help us out with the animals as well. And then a very active volunteer program. We have a lot of teen and some adult volunteers that help us make up salads for the animals and um, help clean them, take care of them. So. We're um, very busy. We have a lot of, lot of um, help out here because we have a whole lot of animals to take care of. Um, owning a zoo is a full-time job and then some. Um, I mean, we're used to caring for animals. I mean, then when animals need the care, they need the care. I mean, we have had late nights where we're out here helping if an animal's sick or someone's laying eggs and we have to kind of keep an eye on things or introducing new animals. Um, so we work usually seven days a week to some degree, but it's, it's, a, some, it's a labor of love. I mean, we just really enjoy what we do. I mean, getting to work with all these cool animals and um, it's just something that, that the whole family enjoys, so it works out that way. Before we started this zoo up, I'd been a zookeeper about 10 years, my wife for several as well. And um, we worked at the Jacksonville Zoo together. She was in the bird department, I was in the reptile department. And when we met, I told her I, was, I wanted to one day open up a reptile zoo. And um, she was game for the idea. And we just kind of um, finished our time up there. And then we went on to work at Disney's Animal Kingdom for a while to see what one of the best zoos in the world, how they do things, what we could take away from there, the ideas and um, ways that they take the best care of the animals for our new facility and uh, we moved to Minnesota. We, we love the city of Owatonna. The, the, the people here have been very welcoming to us. Um, it was tougher uh, when we were searching for a home and a place that we could start up. Um, a lot of cities have no reptile ordinances um, where you can't keep any of those animals and the city of Owatonna did not and um, 
we joined the Chamber of Commerce our, our first year here and have been a member since and the city's just been very welcome to us so we would like to find ideally find some land near here where we can build something much larger. Our, I think our the crowd favorite and probably our biggest attraction here at the zoo is Big Al. He's a about, about 12 foot long alligator weighing in at close to 500 pounds. I used to take care of him at the Jacksonville Zoo down in um, Florida. He'd been there since World War II. And when we um, started to open up our zoo, I, I contacted a friend of mine that I used to work with down at Gatorland there in Orlando. And um, I mentioned I was looking for a large alligator for our zoo. And he, he mentioned that he had acquired one a while back. He had it on one of his properties. And it was from the Jacksonville Zoo. We got to talking and realized it was an animal I'd cared for many years before. So it was kind of fun to have an animal that we already had a little bit of a relationship established there. So. Um, we loaded him up in a moving truck and drove cross country. It was a pretty interesting trip. Um, you get to the Jackson or get to the Florida Georgia state line, and they ask if you have any um, animals or produce to declare. And I told them I had a 12 foot alligator in the back of my moving truck, so we had all the staff from the entire office out there um, wanting to check out our alligator. So um, yeah, made, made for an interesting day. Reptiles do have personalities to some degree. I mean, some of those. Um, are turtles and crocodilians a lot more so in, in lizards than the others. Snakes, not, not quite as much. They just um, eat and rest and <laughs> not too much otherwise. But um, some of our lizards and crocodilians, we actually do animal training with them. When we have kids out at the zoo, a lot of times we'll call our turtles over. We'll tap on the railing. We teach them that that's the cue. We have all the kids knock on the railing and then um, all of our turtles come. It's a little avalanche of turtles heading our way and um, the kids get to feed them. So we do training with them. They're actually pretty bright. Um, at one point we had our alligators in the stage behind me here with some, a snapping turtle and some box turtles and we started training the alligators that when we would tap our tweezers on the stump that they would come over to eat. After a couple months of doing that, as soon as we would tap our tweezers, every turtle in the exhibit as well as the alligators would be charging us in the center there waiting for a snack. So um, some of them have, have some pretty interesting personalities. Some of the lizards are monitor lizard especially. I'm very interested in keeping the, this as a family business for many years to come. I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon. Um, I just would like to buy land and just make a world-class attraction here in South Minnesota. Um, we're just, we'd like to keep it in the family. I'm, I'm hoping that um, one of our three daughters might take on the business again, whatever their interests are, they are. But if they would like, um, we'd love to keep this going and make it an attraction for another 50 to 100 years, kind of like Reptile Gardens out in South Dakota. I went there when I was six. I thought it was the coolest place in the world, and it just inspired me to build my own. Oh, why do you come on this side so they can see your face? Back under, back under the snake. Right under the snake. All right, here, turn around. In the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. This line from Lord Tennyson's poem, Locksley Hall, has rung true for many a resident in Steele County. Today, we learn about the customs surrounding marriage, gowns, ceremonies, and vows. How have they changed over time? And we hear some memorable stories about this special day from a local historian. I think the primary initial goal was let's show some gowns, because they're the star of the show, I mean, really. And when you look at uh, what a lot of historical societies are doing, it's all about fashion, it's all about gowns. My name is Daniel Mockley, uh, the Archives Director of the Steele County Historical Society. Why don't we take a look at some of the traditions, see how they are expressed in the county history over time, and let's look at genealogy. Wouldn't it be interesting to take a look at the genealogy behind these couples who are being married, take a look at where they're from, and see if we can draw any information from that. So we found that when we began researching the history of uh, fashion for weddings, that fashion is really tied to international events. We talk about, uh, and, and uh, material culture. So early on, um, there's a great influence in, first of all, the general wealth of the area. And then 
as time progresses, we move on to see a major change when, in the 1920s that came along with suffrage and women's rights. So suddenly it became uh, an opportunity for women to express their individuality. One of the most interesting and certainly humorous um, developments in wedding culture is the uh, reception. So receptions were not really common uh, to weddings uh, in the early days of Steele County. I'd say we get up into the 1940s and up until that time we see what's called a shivery. Once a couple is wed, then maybe a week or two after the wedding. The neighbors all get together in the middle of the night. So under the cover of darkness, they'll go down the road to the newlyweds home and um, well, the banging of pots and pans, the hoots and hollers and shouting might begin and it will continue until the wedding couple uh, gets up, puts on their wedding clothing and cooks a meal and serves a meal to the neighborhood. Um, many couples responded to this by setting a, a time and a place for a meal. So the wedding reception really began as a way to say, hey, just let us sleep. I mean, we're trying to get, get a new life going here. One of the challenges for county historical societies is trying to make people of cultures who have recently settled be reflected in the history. We happen to have very strong connections with uh, Kadra Muhadeen. She said, sure, I'll be in and I'll bring some items and we'll talk about Somali culture. In marriage, the most important thing in Islam, because most of the Somalis are Muslims, um, is signing the contract of the marriage. And we do it in a ceremony called Nikah. And in the ceremony, the bride or the groom, they can either be present or they can have a representative, which can be his father or her father, his brother or her brother. We have to have at least two witnesses, but most of the time, the families of both sides are present. As a symbol, um, the most important thing is the vows, and we don't read vows, but we talk about, you know, we talk about it, how much important it is in this unity, that you stay together, that you're patient. That is the most important thing, uh, more than the ring. Um, some couples wear rings uh, and exchange rings during um, their marriage time, and some don't. Traditional Somali gown looks like um, something called guntino. It's a long piece of um, clothes. It's not like sari, but when you look at the piece of the clothes, it looks like sari, but we wear it differently. We grab the front and the back, and then we tie it from the shoulder, and then we wrap it around our waist. Every bride uses henna in the Somali culture. It's, it's the most important part for the bride when she's dressing up, so she gets her hair done, she gets henna done. Some women put the henna all the way to their elbows. Some do it on their back, on their shoulders, different parts of their body, which, which, wherever they prefer. I hope that when people leave the wedding traditions exhibit, they'll have a, both a deeper connection to their past, but also an appreciation of the present and of their neighbors, especially as we continue to uh, bring, hope to bring in more and more cultural diversity, uh, gowns of people from different culture, and educate uh, both ourselves and the community about the traditions of the different cultures and how they're more alike frequently than they are different. By day, Alan Eskins is an attorney in Mankato, but at night, he writes mystery novels.
His first book has been on several bestseller lists. All of his novels take place in Minnesota, where the icy winter backdrop has become one of his characters. We visited with Eskins to learn how he does his whodunits. I can sit down and talk about a paragraph that I wrote the way my brothers can talk about how they sank an 18-foot putt. My name is Alan Eskins, and I'm a writer. My day job is I am a criminal defense attorney in Mankato. My first novel, my debut, is The Life We Bury, and my second novel is The Guise of Another, and then I have a third novel, The Heavens May Fall. They are mystery. Uh, they're all a little bit different. Um, the first one is kind of a literary mystery. The Guise of Another, my second novel, is a cross between mystery and thriller. And my third novel is more of a legal thriller. I wasn't really drawn to writing in my younger days. I was into theater in high school and college. And so being in theater, I developed this creative side. But then I went to law school and um, quit doing theater. And there was this part of me that needed to express that creativity. And I had a degree in journalism, I had a degree in law, and those both are writing-based. So I started looking into writing as a way to express myself creatively. And that's when I, when I got out of law school, I started taking classes on creative writing. All three books are based in Minnesota. Um, they're all, the first book has a protagonist who is a student at the University of Minnesota. He's from Austin and he's kind of running away from home to go to college. Uh, and so most of the novel takes place around the campus um, and in this nursing home, but a lot of it does take place in Austin. I have some familiarity with Austin. Um, my daughter went to high school in Austin, but also Austin has a reputation for being a blue collar town. And when I created the character of Joe, I wanted him to come from a blue-collar background. And when I describe Austin in the novel, um, I describe it from Joe's perspective, from the perspective of a teenager who's dying to get out of that town. Austin also had 13 bars, not counting hotel bars and service clubs. And with a population of 23,000, give or take, Austin had one of the highest bar-to-citizen ratios in greater Minnesota. I knew the bars well, having been in every one of them at one point or another. I stepped into my first bar when I was a mere nub of a kid, probably no more than 10 years old. My mother left me at home to keep an eye on Jeremy while she went out for a drink or two. I am a very poor reader. I'm a very slow reader. Um, I have this daydreaming imagination that's constantly running. And so as I'm reading something, if I read a sentence that makes me think of my own writing process, I'm daydreaming now about something else, and so I have trouble focusing on a book. So most of my reading actually I do in my truck with books on, on CD. I have my favorite authors, Dennis Lehane, who wrote Mystic River and uh, Shutter Island, uh, an author named Tom Franklin. He's got a book out there called uh, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter. He's got a few books, actually. Um, he's a really, really talented writer. Uh, I am a genre writer, <laughs> but my job as an attorney is to take a, a case, an investigation, and dissect it and try and find the flaws and the holes. And so I was drawn to mysteries just because of my day job. I am a big believer in outlining. Uh, I think that I can write more complex plots, more complex characters. I can have better subplots if I outline it in advance. For The Life We Bury, the mystery aspect of the novel keeps people reading forward. And the personal aspect, the relationship, draws them in deeper. That was my goal, at least. For the most part, when I write a character, it's an amalgamation of people I know, um, people I've come across in my law practice, you know, um, friends, relatives, even characters on TV. Uh, Joe is 
a, a lot of me in some ways. Um, like I said, he ran away from home to go to college, and I kind of feel I did the same thing. My dad owned a drywall company in Missouri, and I decided that I wanted to get into Iowa to go to college so that I wouldn't be doing drywall on the weekends, so I didn't have to you know, go home and hang sheetrock. I believe in my novel, Winter is almost a character. That's the wonderful thing about being a Minnesota writer, is you have these brutal, strong, powerful winters that can be characters in a novel. I made the decision early on that I was going to go traditional publishing. With the explosion of the non-traditional publishing, there is, the big thing is, how do you get noticed now? How does your book rise above everybody else's? And I decided that a traditional publisher would be the best way to go. I was rejected by 150 agents before I finally got one. It takes me about a year to do a novel. My third one, The Heavens May Fall, the one that's coming out in October, took a little longer. One of the things that I think really helped my writing was a teacher named Terry Davis here at the at Minnesota State University, Mankato, who talked about, as a writer, you should seek to evoke. And what that means is, you're not there to tell a story. You're there to tell a story in such a way that it evo evokes emotion, evokes understanding, that there, that the reader walks away with, you know, something from here, not just from here after they've read your novel. That's the that's the goal. That's the aim. You don't always hit the mark, but that's what you shoot for. I will sit there at an airport, or you know, and I'll be describing things in my head. You know, how would I write this on a page? I was doing that before I was a published author. And so if I'm doing that in my head anyway, might as well put it on paper. Quilting is a sewing technique that goes back hundreds of years. In the 12th century, it was used in conjunction with armor to protect crusaders. Today, quilting occupies a more decorative role and has a devoted following of women and men. Mike Ellingson shares his love of quilting and his students demonstrate the social and aesthetic benefits of the craft. I love quilting. I'm Mike Ellingson. I'm a retired music educator who lives in Blue Earth, Minnesota with my wife Sue. I'm an avid quilter in retirement and also an active church and community musician. In the United States, quilting started right away. Uh, people always imagined that quilting was uh, colonial folks using the scraps of fabric left over. And actually, it was done by the wealthy women who had time to do this. The big re-interest in quilting was back in the bicentennial in 1976, 40 years ago, where suddenly people started to look at old arts and crafts that were original to colonial United States and suddenly quilting was of interest again. The big invention that caused things to take off, however, was about 1979, the Olfa Company invented something called a rotary cutter. Think of a pizza cutter that could cut through fabric. Hand quilting was really the only respected way to quilt for years and years. And then about in the 1980s, machine quilting started to be introduced. And at first it was, like all new technology, very crude and, and really paled against the beautiful hand quilting that people had become used to. Bit by bit though, machine quilters, long arm quilters, would become more artistic, try to copy some of the beautiful hand quilting of, of former days. And in the 1980s, the first quilt in the uh, American Quilt Society's competition to win best of show was a machine quilted quilt. And you would have thought the world was going to end by all the gasps when that happened. Quilting isn't just utilitarian. You know, we, we 
We come from steady stock here in Minnesota, so we think everything must be useful. And that's a good thing for it to be useful, but it also needs to be beautiful. I think it's a great hobby for anyone to have. A wall hanging is a wonderful introductory project because you're, it's a smaller size. You're not trying to complete a queen-sized uh, object but quilt before you uh, finish the project. Also, a lot of artists have gotten involved, so there are three-dimensional sculptures, boxes and such, that are, are quilted. I'm lucky enough to, once I've got my daily chores done, to be able to go, go in the room where I quilt and just, just enjoy my time there. That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.